message tonight. Thank you for church. I thank you for another opportunity to be here. Lord, I pray that you bless your people, bless the Sunday school teachers and the Sunday school kids. I pray that they would get a blessing out of their lesson tonight as well. Thank you again for the freedom and liberty in our country. And we pray, Lord, for our leaders. Pray that you'd, you'd help them, Lord, to lead us in a, in a righteous and godly manner. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, tonight I'm going to preach on the word charity. On the word charity. Uh, we'll get into some of the things on charity, but I want to start off with uh, a definition. And I'll read it once we get to our text. Turn to Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 2 and Revelation chapter 3. Anybody know which church charity is associated with in the book of Revelation? The word charity is associated with which church? That's the obvious answer. Philadelphia, and that answer would be incorrect. Now, of course, that would be a trick question. <laughs> it's not Laodicea. Laodicea is what? Basically, it's a reference to this age. <laughs> And it's the last of the churches when you think about the ages. Lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth because I'll say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Isn't that us? Totally us. Philadelphia, the Lord said about them, they were faithful because they kept his word and they did not deny his name. But it's not them. Any other guesses? It's not Sardis. Sardis means red ones. Did you know that? Sardis was the most persecuted church period, and they meet red ones because of all the blood that was shed, uh, a lot of martyrs. But you'd think maybe it would be them, but it's not them. Anybody else? Pergamus. Is it Pergamus? Much marriage? It's not. Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, kicked off that church with Constantine seeing the cross in the sky and converting to Christianity, and the world, much married, the world and the church became like this and that's where you got all of your easter bunnies and christmas trees and everything else that the church adopted from the world before that it was separate he found a way to blend them because if he can't beat them join them that was basically everything that happened there 325 a.d was it ephesus the first church it wasn't ephesus you think wow the lord said he was upset with ephesus because why they left their first love be zealous, therefore, and repent and hold to the first works. Uh, but it's not them. I only missed one, haven't I? Two. Ephesus, Smyrna. Smyrna. You think maybe it'd be Smyrna. There are some great Christians in Smyrna, but it's not Smyrna. It's Thyatira. It's Thyatira. Now, I was thinking about this. Maybe the word Thyatira, or maybe the word charity was associated with Thyatira, because of their the cruelty that was expressed towards them, they were martyred too quite a bit. But they had charity. They had charity. And perhaps through their charity, that's what brought in the great revivals with Philadelphia. Think about it. Because Christians and people, people, the world, begin to see the charity of these people that were being martyred for their faith and being greatly persecuted for their faith but they were charitable. Now, again, the word charity speaks more volumes than the word love. God knew when to put the word love in the Bible. It wasn't up to man to change every time charity appears in the scripture to love. God knows the difference between them, doesn't he? And when he uses love, beloved, let us have charity one to another. No, beloved, let us, let's sing it together. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another, First John 4, 7 and 8. You think God knew when to use the word love? How many times did love just appear in that song, in those verses? Tons. Charity, charity, very important. 
charity, charitable. Okay. The word charity appears 24 times, I believe it is, in your scripture. And we'll go through a lot of those verses tonight. But charity deals with, and there are three, three different definitions that I wrote down. Charity deals with generosity and helpfulness, especially toward the needy or suffering. When we talk about charitable gifts, Christmas time, Salvation Army, give to the charity or give to the charity of your choice. What are you doing when you do that? You're showing generosity and helpfulness, especially towards the needs of the needy and the suffering. But it goes beyond just that. It's not just about fundraising and charity and all that kind of charitable gifts. It's benevolent goodwill. Okay. What did the Lord, what did the angels talk about when Christ was born? Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. So there's much more than just love. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men associated with charity. Okay. Benevolent goodwill toward or love of humanity. Okay. But when we love humanity, we'll express chari charitableness. And then here's the other one. And I really like this last part of the definition. It's, and think about this. If we learn nothing else from charity, learn this. Lenient judgment of others. Lenient judgment of others. And basically in that, it's telling us, don't be judgmental. Do you ever hear somebody say, hey, have some charity. Be charitable. Have some charity towards them. Be lenient in your judgment towards others. When you're critical all the time, that's not good. It's not the right attitude to be critical all the time. Somebody might do something. You're critical. Uh, they're just doing that because they want to they shine in the eyes of others. They're, they're a hypocrite. Don't pass judgment on things. Be lenient in your judgment. Show some charity. Maybe they are doing it out of a good heart. You say, but judgmental. I judge them because I've seen them in the past. Well, have some charity. Charity. Philadelphia wasn't the church. It was Thyatira. Let's read in Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. We'll just look real quickly and then I'll get deeper into the message. Revelation chapter 2 and look in verse 18. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works. And can't God say that about all of us? Is he going to say that about the road to Emmaus Baptist Church? Do you think we'll be judged as a church? I think we will be. And I'll be judged as a pastor, and you'll be judged as a congregation. And the Lord will say, I know your works. And hopefully the statements that he says after that are good statements. I know thy works and charity. It's the only time associated with the seven churches. And charity and service and faith. See, these people were extending themselves for the sake of Christ. And God was pleased with that. They were extending themselves charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. Very good stuff. And the last to be more than the first. Now we look at the second part and we say, well, but Thyatira wasn't a great church because notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So they did have a fault. They did have a fault, which most of the churches do when you read about them. Okay, so let's go to Revelation chapter 3 and see Philadelphia real quick and see what God says about them. Revelation chapter 3, and <clears throat> let's look in verse number uh, 3, verse 7. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? And again, Philadelphia comes right after 
Well, I'm sorry, it comes after Sardis. So we have Thyatira, Sardis, my fault. Uh, Sardis was the greatly persecuted martyr church. Then we have Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So you see that when God opens a door, man can't shut it. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So great church, uh, but we have charity associated with uh, Thyatira. Now, charity is one of those words, it has a whole chapter dedicated to it. And when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which we'll do to close out this message, all the new Bibles take the word charity and they change it to love. Uh, the greatest, the three, faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. And you'll see when you, you can't ever get a plaque that says faith, hope, and charity. It's always faith, hope, and love. But again, God knows when to use the word love. He chose to put the word charity in there, and that word should stay. Okay? Now, the reason charity is so important is because it is in the progression of the Christian life that we learn about it. Now, you're going to see two different things here. In a sense of aging, the sense of aging, a person as they get older should have more charity as they get older. A Christian as they progress and develop as a Christian and grow as a Christian should have more charity as they grow. It's paramount. It's paramount, okay? It's in the progression of the Christian life. And let's go to 2 Peter. We're going to get some, some verses here. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. The Bible tells us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But here in verse number one of 2 Peter chapter one, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, now watch, giving all diligence add okay add to your faith what are we supposed to add add to your faith virtue so as we grow we should our faith should grow and as we grow our faith not only grows but we add to our faith virtue and that's something that directly comes from christ because when the woman touched the hem of his garment what did he say i perceive that virtue has gone out of me so Virtue is associated with good women. Who in the Bible, virtue is linked to. Who was the virtuous woman? The whole town knew it. The whole town, all the people knew that who was virtuous? Ruth. Ruth was a virtuous woman. Okay? Add to your faith, virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. Now you're going to see that you can get all the knowledge in the world. But without charity, knowledge is nothing. It's, it's no good. But it says virtue, faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. 
For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the last thing there in the progression? Sometimes it takes a while to get that. That's why someone who's newly saved, give them a little charity. Give them a little grace. Someone newly, it's newly saved should never be as grown and developed as someone's been saved 20 or 25 years, right? So sometimes new Christians, they lack these things. And it's up to somebody who's older in the Lord to help them to grow to the point where they get these things. Okay? It's a development. Okay? Not only, not only in the Christian life, but it's also development in life itself. In life itself. And let's look at that. Let's go to Timothy and Titus. Let's go to Titus first. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And verse number 1. We'll read two verses. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in what? Charity. Charity. It doesn't say that to the women here. It says it to the men. And what men? Aged men. We have any aged men in here? <laughs> Dave Spratley's looking around. Who would say, uh, yeah, I think I'm an aged man. Come on, put your hand up. You think you're, Billy, put your hand up. Aged man. See, Billy's in need of charity. <laughs> so says the scripture. No, Billy's charitable. Right, exactly. If he's going to join us, but the aged men, what would we say aged men are? What age? What are we thinking? 50 plus? 50 and above? 40 and plus? That's middle aged. Middle aged. <laughs> middle aged. 35 to 40 and 55. You think 55? That's when you get the Kennywood discount at 55. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> I was there. I was 54. Guy said, How old are you? I said, why? He said, how old are you? I said, 54 and a half. And he said, all right, you qualify. I said, for what? The Kennywood discount. I said, that's fantastic. Stamp my hand. <laughs> and I got the 55. Now, I'd say that's a charitable gift, right? So we'll go with 55. So aged men, if you're 55 and older, you should be starting to think about being charitable. Being charitable. I got to say this. My wife and I enjoy watching uh, How America Was Founded. Many of those, like uh, the, men, the one, The Men Who Made America. That was a fantastic one. That had uh, Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and my favorite, J.P. Morgan. I just like that guy for some reason. But anyway, Rockefeller, Rock, Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, they got to a point in their life where all of a sudden they were trying to outgive each other. And, at, and it was right after J.P. Morgan died, and they realized, we're next. So they didn't want to go out like he did, kind of. So they said, they we're going to give it away. They couldn't give it away fast enough. That's why everything around here is Carnegie Museum, Carnegie Science Center, Carnegie Libraries, Carnegie, because that's all he did. He just gave us, build it. He said, build it. Here, take it. I don't want it anymore. What happened to him? He began to think about death. And, and this is the whole premise of the movie Scrooge. He has that vision there, that dream, and he sees the three ghosts, Christmas, Christmas past, present, and future. I like when Christmas present says to him, he says, how many brothers do you have? I said, 1,835. And he thought, <laughs> and something like that, 1,800. He said, 1,835 brothers. I should know I have 1,835 brothers. What he meant was every Christ, Christ, Christmas up to that point. But they, and in the movie, he is just so tight. 
and he realizes, hey, I can't basically take us with me. So the aged men should be charitable, charitable. That's not just to give, but to have love with it as well. Love with it. And that's something in life that you got to kind of learn. And that's why the Lord says, you aged men, you ought to think about charity and become charitable, charitable. Now, again, progression in the Christian life. And when we think about the secular life, it's the same thing. And God does divide kind of the Christian with the aged men there. Let's go to uh, let's go to Second Timothy two. I got, I got a real blessing out of studying these scriptures and seeing the way the Lord kind of pens them down here and in, in, and lets us get them in in writing here. Uh, it says in verse twenty two, and again, this is about the youth and about growth. And I've noticed this word charity goes along with growth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee, also what? Youthful lusts. So there are certain lusts that comes along with being young. And some of you young people in here, what are those lusts? Uh, we, just, we just talked to the older men in here, and now let's talk to some of you youth in here. Flee, also youthful lusts. What are these? What are these? What did the Lord say? Flee these youthful lusts. What are they? Any any of you young people? Sports cars. That's middle aged though, isn't it? <laughs> Every middle aged man, I got to get myself a sports car. And, you know, they say, "Wow, he's going through what a midlife crisis." So I would say that's midlife. But youthful lusts, good times, good times, partying all the time, right? Youthful lusts. What else? Come on, young people. What are some? Go ahead. A nice house. There you go. Those are the things I'm looking. That's not you say, but that's a that's a dream. Yes, but some of the things that young people aspire to, the Lord says, watch aspiring to the wrong things. Youthful lusts. You don't have it right now. You're a starving student. Some of you. You say, man, when I get out, I'm getting a job and I'm going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars and I'm going to buy, 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 buy. And I'm going to get, 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 get. And I'm going to set my light. The Lord says, whoa. Ooh. He pulls back the rain. <laughs> Watch it. Flee also youthful lusts. Be careful. The world can be a very dangerous place, can it? Flee also youthful lusts. But follow what? Righteousness. It's okay to dream, but make sure that within your dreams, you're dreaming the right way. Righteousness, faith, charity, peace. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay? So with youth. The Lord says, follow after charity. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Okay, here we go. Look at the word. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Who was Timothy written to? That's, that's your question for the evening. Who was Timothy written to? It was written to Timothy. And he was a what? Pastor. He's a young man. Paul tells him here, let no man despise thy youth. He was a young man. But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in what? Charity. Basically told him here, show maturity, be an example in not just word, conversation, but in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. So he said, make sure you're reading your word, reading the word, the Bible. Make sure you're reading it. Give attendance to reading. Okay? Grow mature show charity now here's another one here's another one 
Let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at this. Maybe you're taking care of a baby. And for all of you women in here who raised kids, when was it toughest to serve the Lord? When was the hardest time? I heard so many women, so many women say, I feel like I'm going nuts. I'm going to break. I can't stand it anymore. These kids are driving me nuts. It's just that they weren't driving them nuts, but everywhere they went, the kids demanded, 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 even in church. How many of you women found yourself in a nursery behind a closed door without any messages coming to church and all you do is say, okay, time to go to church. And your husband sit there and he'd be prepared to get his Bible and open it. He's going to learn. And the kids started crying and mom had to take the baby out. And how many times have I heard over the years, pastor, Every time I try to go open my Bible and read it, my kids won't let me. They'll grab it. They'll pull it out of my hand. They'll turn the pages. I can't focus. I can't pray. I can't read my Bible. Okay. The Lord says, I got a verse for that. Okay. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. The Bible says, notwithstanding... She shall be saved in what? Childbearing. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Now it's talking about a woman. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and what? Charity. Charity. That word appears there with women who are raising children. Childbearing years. Charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, the Apostle Peter said that this needs to be preferred above all, everything. Charity needs to be preferred above anything. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. And wasn't it Peter who kind of struggled with this? Did he show charity when he tried to cut Malchus's head off? That wasn't very charitable. <laughs> you say, well, he cut his ear off. Now, he wasn't just going for the ear. You know, it would have been kind of weird to see a head pop off and the Lord said, I can put that back on. But <laughs> Malchus saw the glare, the gleam of the sword in the, in the light at night coming off of the candle or torch or whatever it was. He saw a glimmer and I'm sure Malchus turned his head because that glimmer was coming towards his head. And instead of it taking off his head, it took off the ear instead. And Jesus goes and finds the ear and he puts it back on. Peter didn't show much charity there. Peter didn't show much charity when he denied the Lord either. He didn't show, he didn't show much of that. But yet, Peter, the older man, writes and says in the book of 1 Peter, this is most important. And you can, you can imagine when he wrote his epistles that he was reflecting upon his very life too and some of the things that he did. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Wow, that doesn't sound like Peter would be talking there, but he says fervent charity. The other one who talks about charity a lot, is the same one who held somebody's coats while they killed somebody else. Paul. Paul. He held he held the garments of those that martyr that killed, martyred Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He was the one who was responsible for permitting it and allowing it to happen. In fact, he sought out others, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Did he show charity there? Absolutely not. But yet he writes in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and let's look in verse 14.
Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14. Let's look in verse 13. Let's go to 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. I'm in chapter 3, verse 13 of Colossians. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, so he and Peter say this is, this is the most important, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Okay? Charity, charity, charity. Boy, they all speak highly of this. We should have charity amongst the brethren. It's the other thing. We should have charity amongst the brethren. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. In verse number 3. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So charity, not just to the world, not just to the brethren outside the church, but charity especially to the people that are here. And that's one thing. If somebody comes into church and here somebody has a need we ought to look at that we ought to say that person has a need whether it's a need in prayer or whether it's a need even financially if that person has a need and you see that need our bowels of mercy our charitable spirit should come out we should be able to say hey i i want to help you with your need and that's something that again comes with growth it comes with growth and you could see when somebody has grown with the lord and they reach out and help. And again, not just through money, but through other means, through support, through maybe some counsel, through some encouragement. And again, we should have that in our church. We should have that. Boy, what's what's going on? You know, you see a need or somebody just looks down and you go over and put your armor on them. And you say, what's going on? Everything OK? You know, talk to them. Hey, do you need prayer? Pray for them. Show charity charity towards them that is most important we could talk about knowledge all day long right we can talk about what we've done for christ and how we tried to win the world and how many gospel tracts we passed out but what about towards our brothers and sisters charitable charity and be charitable okay all things paul says all things are to be done with it all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I have two more passages to go, then we're going to read 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And look in verse 14. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 14. Very short verse. I'll wait till you get there. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 14. It says this. Let all your things be done with what? Charity. Boy, it's just not in, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. where it, Charity is found throughout the scripture. And again, thank God he didn't just put the word love there. Because you could say, well, I love them. But what's that telling you to do? What does charity tell you to do that love doesn't? Have action. Have action. You can say, well, I love you. But when you have charity, you're demonstrating your love towards that person because there's action involved. You're expressing your love towards that person. I love you with charity. Let all things be done with charity. And charity is an unselfish act because you're giving of yourself to somebody else. Now, the Bible goes as far as to say this. 
knowledge puffeth up. So is it good to have knowledge? Is it good to have knowledge? Can it be a bad thing? Daniel says that in the latter times, knowledge shall be increased. Now you think, well, that's a good thing. Is knowledge increased today? Yes, people know things that the, boy, I just look it up. I can speak into my phone. As we were driving down, I wanted to know what the population of Arkansas was. I just talked it right in my phone. What's the population of Arkansas? We wouldn't see any homes. We drove for miles. I said, who lives here? What's the population of Arkansas? It's like 2,900,000 people, 900,000 people, something like that, under 3 million people. I said, so what's the population of Dallas? There were more people living in the Dallas-Fort Worth area than the whole state of Arkansas. You say, I didn't have to go to the library to look that up. I just talked into my phone and I found it right there that quickly. Knowledge shall be increased. But what's important with knowledge? Knowledge without charity is basically worthless. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And aren't you seeing the lack of charity in our world today? Knowledge is increasing, but what's decreasing? Charity. Charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. I'll wait for you to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. We're a little slow moving in our Bible tonight. Got to get those fingers exercised. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity does what? Edify it. So knowledge without charity is no good. Is no good. Now, finally, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're all just going to kind of sit back and we're going to enjoy this chapter. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. And we're going to, I'll read down through. And if you have, if, uh, nobody here does, but if somebody is going to read this out of a new Bible or new translation, again, it would have the word love replace charity in every one of the past, every one of the places. But we already understand that charity is more than just love. Charity is an expression of love. First Corinthians 13, verse one, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am what? Nothing. Well, you'd say, boy, I wish I had all that stuff in verse two. Yeah, but without charity, the Lord says you're nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave its, itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth. This is, this is really a good part of this right here. Beareth all things. Let's stop right there for a second. How hard things can some things be to bear? And how many times in life has life gotten sour where you say, man, life is so hard. It's so hard. But with charity, God says, you can bear it. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but 
But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, wasn't charity dealing with youth? Wasn't it dealing with aged men? Wasn't it dealing with women who were in childbearing age? Wasn't it dealing with growth as a Christian? Now look what God inserts. Verse 11. When I was a child. Wow. I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. You know, in all my years of being saved and reading this and almost memorizing this chapter, I always got to verse 11 and I said, why did you put that in there? Doesn't it seem like it's a different thought altogether than the whole chapter? So why did God put in verse 11? Because he wanted you to understand charity comes with what? Age and growth maturity we begin to understand life better and we begin to understand here's the deal so many people live their life and they never get the point of why we live and the lord's saying if you live to be old enough understand what your role is here our role here is not to live for who it's not to live for self. Our role here is to commit our life to others. Be not weary in what? Well doing. How many times does the Bible say that we are to be examples? Somebody should be able to see our life and say, that's the way to live. They get it. The world today, the problem with the world today is selfishness. Everybody is focused on me. But when you have charity, you understand it's not about me. We live for others. Our very existence is about taking me and becoming charitable to others with what God has given me. When I was a child, I spake as a child. For the most part, what are children? Most of the time, you have to teach them how to what? Share. That's my doll. That's my truck. Yeah, but little Johnny doesn't have a truck. Give him your truck. My truck. We'll get you a better truck. <laughs> And they might. They might. Would it be a red one? I'll get you a red one. Isn't that the greatest thing in the world? Or a child out of their heart. You don't even have to say, I'll get you a new one. Or a child out of their heart says, you can have my doll. And nobody asked them to give it. And, you, and everybody's, Wow, did you just see that? You know why? Because that's unexpected. That's unexpected. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, and it's dealing with charity, I put away childish things. My dad used to read that to me all the time. All the time. I still did. I said, why did you focus on me with that verse? All the time. 
He didn't read that to my sisters. Kevin, you know, the Bible says, I'm like, why are you telling me? Tell her. Tell Colleen. I'm not talking to Colleen. I'm talking to you. When I was a child, I know, I get it. I know, it. I, I have already memorized it. I never understood why I belonged here until today. And now I do. It says in verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Amen. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. You can find that in a plaque, buy it. Because you rarely can find that one. It's always faith, hope, and love. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. That's a pretty great thing, isn't it? Okay. Let's have some charitable prayer. 